Well, hello, and thank you for joining me for another Alex on Tech and Tech Advice on Life video interview. I'm here at IFS Connect in Sydney in uh, May 2024, and I'd like to introduce Warren Zietzman, the Managing Director of IFS Australia and New Zealand. We have Simon Niesler, who is the Chief Revenue Officer for IFS, and Vijay Jaswell, the Chief Technology Officer. So thank you for joining me. Good to be here. Thank you. Now, uh, before we start, Warren, uh, can you please give us a quick recap of the IFS story in 2024? Absolutely. So, so IFS is, uh, is based out here in Australia and New Zealand. Um, we've got four offices out here. Uh, we've experienced phenomenal growth over the last couple of years, particularly in 2024. It was a very good year for us. Uh, we've had a lot of interaction with our install-based customers, and I think there was a big demand to have an event like IFS Connect today in Australia. Uh, IFS Connect is our first event in this uh, in this particular series. We'll be running future ones. And the whole event is centered around collaboration. It's around thought leadership and around understanding what does the future look like. So it's a fantastic event to be at, and uh, I'm really proud to be at it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. Now, later this month, uh, in May 2024, you'll be releasing the new IFS Cloud 24R1, uh, which will include upgrades to your IFS.AI capability that launched last year. So how does IFS embed AI into its product innovation to add value to customers, which you've been doing now for more than a decade, despite the current AI craze uh, that emerged when ChatGPT uh, you know, entered the world in November 2022? Well, I'd like to first of all say, I mean, we're, in 24R1, we're releasing the IFS Copilot, um, which will help to kind of amplify user productivity, save user time, as well as asset productivity around predictive maintenance, anomaly detection. And it's not just on the front level, it's not just on the UI level, Copilot. It, the, the sprinkling of AI, as I call it, it, is all the way across. And in fact, we have a very interesting data governance layer and data orchestration layer that helps us pick and choose and bring together the various different data sources. I think it's fair to say, um, through this release, we're, we're about to release 100 tangible use cases for, for, for AI um, and drive them down into what we're calling industrial AI, opposed to just uh, cognitive uh, uh, AI or co-pilot, which a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the other vendors are doing. We think it's much more tangible to have that at the use case level. Yeah. So, I mean, those are, uh, these will be examples of AI-driven functionalities mm. that will benefit customers through the updated IFS.AI. But uh, you know, just expand. This is much more than just a co-pilot. You know, even though co-pilots of your own and, and others are going to be integrated into the future versions as well. Yeah. So this release, it's the IFS co-pilot future. So what's on the roadmap is third-party co-pilot. Mm -hmm. So the ability, for instance, to go from Microsoft Teams and ask questions around what are my outstanding invoices and IFS. Going down the layers will go and do the workflow and go to the various different systems and pull up that information in split seconds and, and present that to the user. Yeah. From the right. Teams interface without having to go back into uh, the IFS interface. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we also heard today during the economic keynote from the Chief Economist of HSBC about how the world really needs to deliver on productivity now more than ever before. In the past, it was like, yeah, productivity, but now, of course, we've got various economic uh, things happening in the world where this really makes a difference. So could you please elaborate on the areas of focus for delivering value to customers, such as workforce productivity and asset efficiencies? Uh, absolutely, and, and there's numerous facets to this. There's frontline worker productivity with our connected worker capability, where we have, if you like, it's almost like a, it's almost like, you know, when you go to YouTube to fix your phone or what have you, it's, it's an instructional video. We have this capability for our field engineers or, or, or shop floor engineers where if they need to do maintenance on a particular piece of equipment, there'll be an instructional video on the steps involved, what safety equipment to wear, what the process is, etc. And then from that, the engineer can carry out the actual work right, and, and, and provide that first time fix, which yeah. saves money. Yep. Rather than going backwards and forwards, you know, we, we, we fix the issue there and then. So from a frontline perspective, there's efficiency increases, as well as from a back office perspective. The part, the person, the engineer needs to install, needs to be ordered. There's a supply chain angle, there's a procurement angle to all of this. And what we've done is we've, because we've got decades of experience in these six verticals that, that, that we approach, we, we've got all that know-how and we've embedded those processes 
uh, into the back end. And I could see it was quite advanced. I mean, even if the video was in German, you had the subtitles to turn it yes. straight into English. And, and again, just, another use of AI. That's an AI engine that translated that German into English subtitles. Yeah. Now, uh, next up is uh, the ESG, or Environmental, Social and Governments requirements of the modern era, which some are abusing with greenwashing claims, but which are now an essential part of doing business in various markets and countries around the world. So how can businesses move beyond viewing sustainability as a requirement and instead see it as an opportunity for growth and development for the entire company? And again, we work with our customers to actually what we have called is inbuilt uh, ESG, yeah. right? So for instance, uh, the circular economy or, or, or remanufacturing. So remanufacturing uses 80% less energy than actually manufacturing a piece of equipment from scratch. And again, so that's that plays into the environment. It also plays into cost savings as well, right? Because you know the, the ability to reuse and re remanufacture a piece of equipment rather than create it from scratch. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, there's a difference between refurbishing and remanufacturing. Refurbishing is changing a few parts. Yeah. Remanufacturing is remanufacturing the whole piece of equipment, whether it's an escalator step or a piece of machinery or a vehicle part. So, I think so, a good example of that, VJ, is uh, Volvo trucks yes. up in uh, up in northern Europe. So they absolutely remanufacture their gearboxes, their clutch, and their engines. Um, for a great ESG result for not only their customers but for themselves. So I think that's a great yeah. real-life example of what you're talking about there. And it plays into environment as well as cost saving for them. Mm. Right. Now, uh, it seems as though I'm asking you all the questions, VJ, but uh, I, w I wanted to ask you about the AI and machine learning. So that's obviously playing a pivotal role in driving sustainability within the energy utilities and resources initiatives. And you spoke about this during your presentation earlier today. Now, uh, can you discuss the benefits of AI fuel predictive maintenance? Mm -hmm. Because you're talking about those escalators, and you know, in your presentation there was the sort of oil that needed to be replenished at a certain time. Yeah. But you know, the AI fuel predictive maintenance programs in minimizing downtime, which of course everybody wants, and optimizing machinery and assets for the uh, deeply desired efficient performance. Absolutely. I mean, one thing IFS does is we ensure these assets, these physical things, remain up. If assets are working, they're adding value. If they're down, they're adding cost, and customers aren't happy. Right? So what we try and do, especially with our anomaly detection, our predictive maintenance engines, is ensure we get an early warning when a piece of equipment is about to go down. So before it goes down, before a customer is unhappy, we know that, right, and from history, and this is where the AI comes in, from historical data, we can kind of deduce from the various different sensor readings that, right, actually, there's an oil leak here because the oil level has gone from 100% to 20% in two hours. So there's clearly an oil leak. So we can, and then again, I think going across to our field service management capability, we can automatically generate an action, find out who the nearest engineer is, it's got the experience to fix this problem, and I think that's really important, has got the right parts, the right tools, get that engineer to this location as soon as possible and instruct the engineer to change this part. So the engineer has to have that part. Maybe go to warehouse B located over here to pick the part up first, yeah. and then go and fix it. And then we, in the modern era, the uh, IoT sensors must be much more mature and sophisticated and giving you much better information that is also fed into your IFS.ai engine. Uh, absolutely, and that, that provides us with that data foundation where we can learn from. But even to build yeah. on that, it doesn't even necessarily be where an, where, where an asset is going to go out or going to go down. If its performance becomes suboptimal, below a determined SLA, mm -hmm. then that can then trigger. And then off that, we can also reroute the application of that asset, that pump, that bearing, to, with some workload balancing to another piece of equipment so that the customer still enjoys that high level of what they're used to with the, with the moment of service. I, I think to add on what Simon and Vijay were saying, uptime is critical. The other thing is, is, is asset life extension. You know, so I think through, through machine learning, through predictive maintenance, we can know when to service these assets so we can get anything from 5 to 10% additional asset life, and that's just going to reduce carbon footprint. You mm. know? Yeah. So you know, where AI is going to come in is, for example, in, in wind turbines or wind farms, for argument's sake, there's different wet, weather patterns, so things will wear differently and need to be replaced at different times. The AI will learn different wet, weather patterns over these areas and understand which parts need to be maintained so that that entire farm gets a, a, mm. a greater life extension you know, so from the asset point. So, yeah. yeah. 
Now, when you were talking about the, the, like the YouTube-style videos that you can see, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously we now have the augmented reality headsets where you can have mm -hmm. this floating in space right next to when you're doing the maintenance. So what is iFest doing with augmented reality headsets? Uh, well, we have a, a rem remote assistance capability. Now, in all these industries that we deal in, manufacturing, energy utilities, oil and gas, aviation, defense, um, the mining industry, Absolutely. right? We're, we're, we're seeing a kind of drain in skill set. Yeah. Right? There's not a lot of experts in the fields. So we can leverage these experts wherever they're located in the world. So if I'm an inexperienced brand new engineer and I'm, I've turned up at a manufacturing facility and I need to change a part, but I'm not quite sure how to open up this piece of equipment, yeah. I can pull out my phone. Yeah. Don't need an expensive iPad. headset. No, you don't. You've got, you've got the device with you already. And they're expensive, yeah. the Apple Vision headset. That's right. But it? I mean, it's great that Enterprise <laughs> takes up these headsets, but if they don't have to have the expenditure, yeah. you don't need it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so pop up phone. I, I contact the experienced engineer that could be located in Melbourne or Brisbane, wherever it may be, and mm -hmm. say, right, can you help me? How do I open up this piece of equipment? Yeah. And then through augmented reality, the engineer in his home could just circle, right, unscrew these four screws, yeah. pull the panel off, and once you pull the panel off, there's, there, 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 I don't know, there's a capacitor you need to pull out, yeah. and then behind that, that's where you change the part. Um, and by the way, we have a, a, a team called IFS Labs that does experiments with kind of next gen and, and new innovative uh, uh, use cases. Yeah. Uh, and we're, we're, you know, we've done a of lot of POCs yeah. with the old headsets. At the moment, they're too expensive. Yeah. And, and the solution, all the engineers have got a mobile phone or an iPad. Yeah. And that's the cheaper, more efficient solution as it stands now, it will change in the future. Of course. And, and where this is becoming very powerful, let's bring it back to Australia for a second. We, we deal with a lot of service management customers and telcos and so forth, where you've got to send out field agents into very remote areas. In the old days, you'd have to send somebody that's going to do the work and possibly an engineer that understands the thing. Now you could have an engineer centralized and servicing 50 field agents in very remote places. You know, So it's a it's a game changer again. Carbon footprint reduction, efficiency, time, that sort of thing. So that's so, time fix. Yep. yep. Very yeah. important for organizations. So you also work closely with channel partners in Australia and globally. So what is the IFS approach to uh, channel partnerships? And can you please tell us more about your partnership with Info Consulting? Yeah, I think um, certainly um, IFS has a defined and clear partner first strategy. Um, I was talking this morning about how no company grows at the rate that we have without um, welcoming and taking advantage of a, of a partner ecosystem. Um, so we are absolutely ensure that we're partner first. We absolutely ensure that partners are able to represent and add value to our to our customers um, and the partner contribution that we have to our revenue streams has has uh, has increased exponentially over the last five years um, and it's a key part of our delivery methodology as far as info consulting uh, Warren do you want to pick that one yeah, up absolutely so so info consulting is one of our strategic partners in Australia here um, we have different types of partners in Australia some may be service partners some may be resellers Info Consulting is a bit unique in that it, it doesn't only act as a service or a reseller, it actually offers some of the IFS services through its own gamut as well. So what that means is effectively they're working with us on some of our customers to, to actually provide services beyond just reselling it and, uh, and um, uh, delivery work. I think what's made that partnership so unique is, is, is their approach to the partnership. I think they've taken it on that they're not just there to feed off our customer base, but they're there to actually grow their own business using the technology that IFS builds for customers. And I think taking that approach has made them as successful as they have. They're only two years into this game and had an incredibly successful year here in Australia last year. And they were a big player in our market in terms of delivering solutions to customers. So, you know, very powerful player, very strategic player. Um, and I'm looking forward to the next three years with the guys. Yeah. And I think that only works, Warren, when you embed them within your organization here. So Absolutely. they're an extension of yourself. They have access to all the same material that VJ's team have. They have access to all the same technical and updates, etc., as if they were an IFS employee. And I think that's a key pillar of, of driving that result, those results. You're on the money there, Simon. That they're a complete extension of IFS in Australia. And I think the other thing that's working well is there's a collaborative approach between the, be, between the partnership and ourselves. Um, you know, very often in, in deals, we're actually selling together. It's it's our technical team, our pre-sales team, their pre-sales, their technical. And we go into the customer, as Simon said today, shoulder by shoulder. You know, yeah. we, we go in there literally standing together as one team. A great example of one plus one equaling three. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking before, of course you're on the money, you're the chief revenue officer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that'll do. <laughs> now, uh, I always like to think that uh, customers can be a company's best R&D division. So 
How does IFS ensure that product innovation aligns with delivering the innovation customers actually need? And you know, in that regard, are there any examples of customer feature requests, you know, pain points you've solved for them that are now widely used by the vast majority of users? Yeah, I think um, as we know, IFS one of its uh, one of its uh, value propositions is we're very very focused on our industries. We only uh, work with six industries. Now that gives us a real focus as to uh, as to value added and uh, industry specialization. And I think I quoted this morning that specialization beats generalization every day of the week. Um, now, well, as a one of the things that I tweeted actually. From, oh, did you? From your yeah. Oh, very kind. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we do to drive that and enable that is yeah. we we obviously have customer advisory boards. We're very close to our customers. We have early adopters of when new technology is coming through. Um, and it's fair to say that we're very, very close to our customers. So mm. we have industry directors who are who are specialists within that given industry um, and have relationships with uh, with uh, those businesses and those industries that go very deep. And I think it's fair to say off the back of that, we've bought through some real initiatives that we've taken to market and, and bought through. I don't know if you want to talk to any of those, Warren. I can absolutely. We, we have a, a global construction firm that runs out of Australia here. Um, and recently they've undergone an upgrade to our latest version, IFS Cloud. In fact, they'll go live in a couple of weeks' time, possibly in the same month and a half. I think the point coming out of that, though, and to expand on what Simon said, the IFS is very much around collaboration, and I open today with around, we actually partner with our customers to understand what is cutting edge, what is best of breed. This particular customer went down from almost 60 customizations to nine. They said, these nine we cannot live without. And, you know, at that time we had a choice. Do we try and run with nine, or do we try and really stick to true evergreen, starting the world with zero customizations? And where we've ended up is we've actually taken six of those those customizations and made them part of the core product, all right? And I think that's testament to where IFS says they partner with customers in order to understand what is industry best practice. We actually put our money where our mouth is, you know? And they will now go live with, for example, I'll tell you one of the features. It was um, uh, variation order management. Um, it's a key area for construction companies. It's absolutely critical. And for many years, we've just had it as an extension into our product, you know? And I think... Looking at this now and really getting this customer to, to sit and embrace with us this concept of it needs to be part of the core product, we looked at this and went, actually, you're right. Actually, all of our customers could use this. And that's one of the key things we've taken into the core among the other five. You know? And I think just building on that, obviously, a big theme of today has been about AI. We've taken that same approach with AI. Those industry directors, IFS industry directors, have been out talking to our pioneer customers within those six industries. And we've worked collaboratively to come up with those hundred um, use case, AI use cases that VJ was talking about that we're rolling out through 24R1 and 24R2 um, throughout this year. Um, and we've been working collaboratively with, uh, with industry on those. Well, just on the topic of 24R2, uh, you know, I guess that's a bit of a sneak peek into what we can expect. But um, how might uh, IFS, mm -hmm. its customers, and even the planet look in, say, 2030 when generative AI-powered robots, of which we've seen the, the, you know, the blossoming beginnings of with Tesla and Jensen Huang at uh, the NVIDIA conference, he had eight of them there, didn't have t uh, Teslas, but you know, he's another big player as well. And these robots are expected to be in manufacturing, in homes, in offices, helping deliver moments of service uh, in truly science fiction ways that, that will become science fact. Interesting. Um, I think really, I think industry, the whole industry 5.0 really plays into this. Yeah. Industry 5.0 being human uh, uh, robots assisting humans. It's like the Iron Man suit, basically, yeah. right? I mean, we have robots got, uh, already, but, yes. but we don't yeah. have the exoskeleton suits like in Aliens or Iron yes. Man, quite yet. But I think if, if you look at AI, the history of AI, as the compute power has increased, yeah. so is the sophistication of AI. Yeah. Chat GPT wouldn't be as sophisticated as, uh, you know, it came, you know, last year was the mass uh, adoption of Chat GPT. Go back 10 years. It wouldn't have happened yeah. because of the compute power. So I think when it comes to, at the moment, humans still have to do the exception jobs. AI can't do that yet. You know, the kind of the gut feel decisions that a human makes in, 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 you know, within an organization. But I think as AI gets more and more sophisticated, AI will be able to take over those types of gut feel tasks based upon history, based upon you know, the, the cognitive, neural, deep learning Right, which is an AI acting more like a human brain mm. rather than a computer. So, uh, so I, I think it's it's just going to help us even more. Right, and I guess some of we're going to learn more about twenty four R two in Orlando. 
We are um, unleashed in Orlando, um, and as a part of that, we're, we're absolutely launching uh, another raft of the, those hundred use cases, those industrial AI use cases. They'll be taken to market, um, and that's where we'll be having five or six global brands talking about how they're using those applications in practice within their organisations to increase productivity and um, and to increase the moments of service they have for their customers. So real world examples of customers using IFS AI um, within uh, within their businesses, and we're really excited about that. Well, well, look, as we get towards the end of the interview, mm. I always like to ask if you could please share a memory of your first computer. Now, for me, that was in 1979. I was four and a half years old, an Exidy Sorcerer being sold from Dick Smith Electronics. The competition was the Commodore PET and the Apple One. It wasn't even the Apple II yet. So, Warren, let's start with you. Well, I'm going to start with how old I was because that will give my age away. But um, my first computer was in 1981. It was a Commodore 64, and uh, I got given it by my, my dad's brother. And uh, the following year, he gave me this uh, coding book on, on how to write programs. It was mostly games, if I'm honest with you. But, but uh, in 1982, I started actually coding on this Commodore 64. I never had a computer screen. I had a, a TV, a little mini TV, and that was my screen. And I actually, for the next two years, really got into this. I mean, I was building games and all this sorts of stuff and learned the basics of good old DOS-based code, if you want to call it that. You know, just typing yeah. the old stuff out. So that's my oldest and first memory of a, a computer. And, and I think, actually, because it's easy to, to forget oh. in the midst of time, but I think the Commodore 64 came out in 84, but in 81 they had the VIC-20, yeah. which was before the C64. I, look, look, yeah, maybe it was 83, I don't know, yeah. but I was very young. But yeah, it was yeah. a, but and, it, and everyone loved that computer, the, the, it was the, games machine. The, the, they launched two 64s, and I'll never forget, my dad's brother, he done very well in life, bought me the latest 64. So when this thing arrived, my, my, my one uncle had the old 64, and I had the new 64. Did you so have the a, tape drive? Uh, the the I, disk drive? Or I, I had the, no, 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 it was, it was like a, a tape you the clicked cassette, in, it was yeah. a cassette it you clicked in. took 20 minutes to load the games. Yeah, and, incredibly oh, long, very, very yeah, long. I mean, for the youngest generation today, they say that instant gratification isn't instant enough. And I've got friends that have shown their kids the old conditions. How does it take 20 minutes to let the game <laughs> want it like that? Oh, yeah. It's never going to happen. So, yeah. uh, VJ? Victoria. There you Victoria. go. Victoria. <laughs> and, and I remember that. You connect up to your TV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bloody yeah. games just take so long to load. Yeah. And I should always try and copy them. You used to get the old tape to tape. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I always yeah. try and copy them. They never worked. Never copied them. Yeah. <laughs> they never worked. Oh. But uh, yeah, Victoria. And then this Commodore 64 came out after that, right? Yeah. I think the Vic 20 had something like 5K of RAM. Yeah. And that was 64K. 64K, yeah, right? Big yeah. difference. Yeah. Well, in 79, Dad paid thousands of dollars to get the 48K extension module, which for 1979 was just yeah. mind blowing. Simon, what about well, you? Well, I was going to say Commodore 64, but now you've mentioned it. My, yeah, my mind's gone back to the Vic 20 and, yeah. Yeah. and t tennis right. up and yes. down on the uh, yes. up and down on the spare television yes. down in the uh, down in the garage. So. That was it. I'm, I'm not sure how it came. I'm not sure what year it was or how it showed up, but I do remember having some pretty good tussles with my brothers on access to uh, on who was going to play with that game. And look, we'll start uh, with you, Simon. I always like to ask if you could please share some mm -hmm. of the best advice you received in life to help you get where you are today. Right. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, um, never accept mediocrity. That's a good one. BJ? Uh, work hard. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Simple as that. Yeah, you know, my, this piece of advice I actually read in a book. It was a quote by Darwin, actually, and I, I tell you what, it, it really has stood me in good stead over the years. It was, it's not the strongest or the cleverest or the fittest that survive, but those that who can adapt to change the quickest. And that's so true in business. I mean, AI, just have a look at that. You can either fight it and argue it and say, well, it's, you know, or you could say, listen, how do I actually make mm -hmm. life better for people using this, you know? And I think for me, that's it. You know, look at the situation. You might not like it. You might not like people. You might not, whatever, but you need to think, hold on, let's just take a step back. How can we actually use this? How can you use that? So, that's a great way to finish. Yeah. So what is your final message to the viewers and the readers? Look. Thanks very much for your support in IFS in Australia. We're a growing business. We're, we're, a, we're a young business here in Australia. Although globally we're, we're an older business, we're a young year in Australia. I think we've got incredible potential. We've got an incredible leadership team here that's coming down supporting us here. Uh, we're running events like IFS Connect. We're taking a lot of our customers and partners to, uh, to Orlando in uh, October with IFS Unleashed. So please just continue the collaboration, continue the feedback, and uh, you know, please keep, uh, keep, keep supporting us, and we'll keep supporting you. Yeah, final message from you, VJ? I think we're all about values. Right, we give, we provide value through our technology to all of our customers, and uh, and and that's the way that's the way we roll, <laughs> right? And 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 we've got so I mean over the four decades that we've been in existence, we've got so many customers that that will you know attest to this and, and mm. underline that value based message approach. 
Um, and I would just build on that, right? So the, the value-based approach that sits on top of the innovation that we have coming through in our technology, um, we give our customers choice. So cho cho choose to work with us. We'll give you the choice around a modular approach that'll give you the ability to get a very fast ROI on any projects. And we won't lock you into, into something you can't get out of in a few years' time and dictate our terms on you. So, um, and finally, thank you very much for the opportunity to come back home to Australia. I haven't been back for a while, and it's a, it's a real pleasure to come back and see see the great work that the team here are doing. Sure. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. I wish you the best of success for the rest of IFS Connect and all the ones to come and in Orlando, and I hope I can speak with you again in the future. Certainly. Thank you, thank thank you. you very much. Thank Cheers. Thank Thanks you. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.